that song. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I'm not sure where you want to start. I'm going to give uh, talk a little bit about um, what I'd like to get is some feedback from those of you that are in the project. I, I, you all know Jana, who's been monitoring uh, your fields, and we took some harvest samples last year, and I thought, you know, for the level of hard shells that we looked at, am I too uh, loud here? Um, I thought for the level of hard shells that we had, that maybe we had a little higher damage that I would have liked. And primarily, it was a, a mix, primarily a maple orange worm, some twig borer, and there was even some leaf-footed staining. So I, I want to get a feel if, if, if you thought, I know it's tough in a group session like this, but if you thought your damage levels were reasonable last year, so you just, if you yell out, you had anything, were there anything above 5%? Nobody's going to say that. <laughs> you know, my neighbor had that. Yeah. I, <laughs> talk to me later, because it really helps me keep focused on what the management uh, the approach should be. I guess the, the next, you, OK, next thing I wanted to, to do is get your feedback on what you want to talk about first. Are mites of interest? I, you know, are mites of interest, navel orange worm, twig borer, leaf footed bug? Is there any particular topic that you'd like me to get on to first here? Leaf footed plant bug? Leaf footed plant bug. Okay, good. Norm, where are you? Norm Presser. Because Norm, Norm's uh, uh, helped me out a lot on this. First of all, um, this is a time when it can be fairly critical. We're actually. Um, just post bloom is the most critical, but the damage from leaf footed on particularly uh, uh, thin husk almonds is gets greatest during April and May, and and for the most part they migrate in from areas that they've overwintered on. Okay, they're overwintering on. Uh, uh, in aggregations, and that's why I called on Norm because he's one of the guys that uh, he owns a orchard out in in uh, just a little bit east of Kerman, and he brought me uh, a tub of leaf-footed bugs. Where did you get those, Norm? Tell him. I covered up an old tractor, and underneath the canvas there was cold, and they were in a big ball. I just tapped on them; they all slid in the jar. And there must have been thousands there. Yeah. And that's how they, they primarily overwinter. Once in a while you get them in, in, a, in an orchard, but in, in most parts they overwinter in covered areas. They don't take cold winters. So I'm, I'm guessing that you know, as we get into those levels with the freeze damage that I've seen on, on citrus this uh, last late winter and in, into the spring, I'm thinking we saw a lot of mortality from that. I, honestly, I haven't been in the field, so I don't know that for sure. But that's, there are two things that relate to uh, established populations, high movement into the orchard. One is your overwintering temperatures, and the other one is this little uh, parasite called gyron that attacks the eggs that you see. And it can be really, really effective, but in almonds, we're so, and, and pistachios too, we're so intense on uh, our navel orange worm management, particularly with some of the insecticides. Um, and even if we use insecticides on leaf-footed bug, it really knocks this parasite out. So uh, we're not seeing the swings in the population based on biological control uh, that we've had in the past. I have not seen any issues. I've got a few leaf-footed bugs on my roses on, uh, at home, but that's about it. Um, has anyone picked up? The, the biggest key is the drop nuts. And, and the real, the real culprit, culprit here are Fritz varieties. Fritz and Sonora are really, really susceptible uh, to leaf foot of it. Part of it's because of the thinner hull, but I think there's some olfactory odor thing that actually attracts them into that group. So, has anybody seen populations yet? Seen drop, that's the biggest key. You, you seen them? How are they looking? Real light this year we're here. Real, real light? West side is the first, and we just found some last week's uh, locally. Okay. Um, remember this orchard had a bunch of mustard. Last right? year this orchard did have more than I thought. We had the field day this year, and I uh, I think I was wrong in saying to hold off a little bit on this 
we saw some stings in that. Gina, you're here, aren't you? Yeah. Do you, do you have much damage? I haven't seen anything. Okay, okay. Well, basically the approach on this uh, to monitor is, is to physically walk in the orchard and look for that curling on the nuts. The curling on the nuts, um, you'll continue to get nut abortion. The real key on abortion is the varieties. Not Perel, not particularly susceptible. Some of the hard shells, Aldrich is uh, fairly susceptible, but Butte Padre, uh, not particularly bad. And I think Monterey is in that uh, moderate area. So that's the first key to look for. And, it, and you'll see them, it's pretty easy. You'll see this curling, and sometimes they'll have a blotch exit it on the nut itself. But you'll see that in a cluster. And the reason I'm talking about that is it's easier to find than the insect. The other way to do it is to take a, a broomstick with you, and if you suspect that, maybe wrap the tree a little, you lose a few nuts. Uh, and, and the adults make such a noise. Have you all heard that? It is like, it's, a, it's like your quail hunt. And, or, or pheasant hunt, and all of a sudden, you'll hear that, that, not quite that loud, but you will hear that noise, and that's a good indication that leaf foot is there. I don't have a, a good, th I, I don't think anybody has a threshold on this thing. I think it depends a little bit on the varieties that you're using, and, or that you grow, and again, um, Sonora and Fritz are key. Uh, a little bit on Monterey, non Perel, not so much. So that kind of depends on your approach. I think on Sonora Fritz, your threshold is very, very low. Your threshold is low. And, and to me, it's not so many you find in one area, but how many places you go to an orchard and you either see the damage or you find the bug. So I wish I could give you a little bit more of a hint on there. Uh, but if you see that damage, you use that broomstick, and you've got a susceptible variety, I would not hesitate putting on a May spray. Unfortunately, the May sprays that you would have to use are those that will trigger mites. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm losing my uh, name of the material here. Uh, Lors Band has always been good. I tend to shy away from that because of the water problems with this particular group. Imidan uh, Brigade was the one I, I wanted to talk with, about. It, Brigade's very, very good on leaf-footed bugs. Um, it will result in spider mite problems uh, if you use that. So you're almost going to have to include a miticide if you have to put that in a maze. So that's the real, that's the real razor's edge on leaf-footed plant bugs. They can do a lot of damage. The only way to manage them, if you've got a population in the orchard, I'd say if you had, if you went to six areas and you found them in two areas of the orchard, I'd say that's probably treatable for the susceptible varieties. For nonpareils, I would say that's not the case. Um, uh, Carmel's uh, not particularly susceptible, at least in my experience. The other material that I think can be used that's uh, effective against navel orange worm, twig borer, and, and uh, leaf footed is imidan. We don't even have that in our guidelines, but it's a, a, a pretty effective material. So I don't know if I'm giving you information that you want or you can use. I wish I could be a little more solid on that. They do have multiple generations. Um, after May, you're not going to get aborted nuts you're going to end up with uh, maybe some black stings on, on those susceptible varieties. But I, my personal feeling from uh, talking to a few of you here that this is not a serious problem this year, that's not to say that individual orchards might not have it. Again, remember those aggregations will occur in certain areas, particularly if pistachios are bordering you, and pomegranates. Pomegranates have been a huge site for wintering populations. They don't get treated quite as intensively, and when they are treated, they're treated earlier in the year. Late in the year is when you get that movement into some of the pomegranate orchards. So those are kind of the keys that you need to look out for to help you judge on what you're gonna, gonna do. Eric? How far into the season do we have to monitor or be concerned about the problem? Um, I'd say probably up to hull spin, split. Um, and it depends, that depends a little. The real 
critical time is up to June 1st. That's the real critical time. After that, it's less damaging, but you can get spotting on the nuts. They won't, uh, they may, once the nut hardens or is in the process of hardening, you'll leave that little black spot on it. It won't shrivel the nut, much like the old shot hole disease. But anything from, say, the first week in June prior, you'll either get abortion or that nut will completely shrivel within the shell. And those nuts that have that will have that curled uh, sap coming out of it. It almost looks like bacterial canker on, on some of the, bacterial canker, of course, is on the trunk, but the sapping looks like that on the nut itself. Uh, the eggs are another key to look for. They're uh, very, do we have pictures of that? I, uh, I'm looking. Uh, uh, in the, in the IPM guidelines on the web, they have great shot of the eggs. They look just like a um, miniature macaroni necklace that's dark brown. So you know when kids, I hope, particularly girls, I think, would make these little necklaces, or if you pretended you were a uh, Native American and wanted a bead necklace, you've got that macaroni stuff and painted. That's what it looks like. The individual eggs look like those macaroni, uh, macaroni, <laughs> that's all I can think of. I had a big, big problem last year. Uh, and I'm at the point where I'm afraid to spray pro matter what. Could it do any good to spray the perimeters? No, I don't think so. I think they move in fast enough. They're, they're a pretty solid flyer. I don't think the perimeters <laughs> will do that. I, I'm glad you're honest with that and bringing that up. I, I, can't, I can't necessarily disagree with it. I mean, you know, you're stung twice, you, you get a little hesitant, but honestly, it's such a variable problem, I'd hate to see you do that, and particularly with the cost of the miticide. Alma's bringing good money, but you, the materials we use, you're going to have to put a miticide. Now, most of you will be doing that anyhow, I guess. If you're doing that anyhow, uh, they, yeah, I... I, I would not recommend doing that. I would work either with your PCA or if you're on the property, make sure you walk through that orchard at night and, uh, and look for that damage. If, if you do, or there's a, um, where it's really easy to see is they go to the flowers on, on uh, gardenias and roses. And you, it makes a beautiful picture with a contrast to that of the flower and the bug itself. But, uh, you know, you're so mad and pissed off that you can't hold a camera steady. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a period between when the insect actually stings to when you start seeing the... Pretty gun. quick. Pretty quick. I'd say you're probably going to see that within a day with the gummy. Uh, drop, I, I don't know, it's probably four or five days, depending on the size of the nut. It's almost immediately with... Uh, very small nuts, but not this size. It's going to take at least a week for it to drop. Okay? Any other specific questions on leaf footed? You're talking materials. Uh, Asana has work. Uh, you're going to, you, th that's the issue. You need something broadly toxic, not some of the more very effective uh, navel orange room products that are selective uh, won't work on leaf footed. Some have mentioned belay. Kenny, have you used that at all? I haven't, but I know people who have and have been happy with it. But I don't know widespread how much it's been used. There's, um, they have a, the adults live for a long time, but after lay eggs, they kind of get pooped out. But if if you if you've seen those eggs, you see the eggs. That's a time where I'd start saying, well, maybe I might use something that's a little softer, belays a nicotinoid and uh, it will kill the very, very young ones. These uh, older ones are like Sherman tanks, so they're pretty hard to get. And they, they don't chew on anything because they're sucking sap, so you're not chewing and getting the stomach poison into them. So that's part of the issue. You've got to get it on there. Would a summer oil be affected? No. No. Not at all. OK. Yes. How a quick, how, how important is it to do a whole field, say if you have multiple blocks and are they going to move back in from, say if you don't, if you're not able to finish, say you've got four blocks and you only... I think you okay, the question was how important it is to do a whole field, you've got multiple blocks. Are they going to kind of move around? Or they, they do move around, they do move around. Um, 
I don't know if I can answer that well, but I would try to get as much of that orchard done at one time. I think you probably have a little bit of residue on the leaves with these materials that if the bug gets onto them, uh, after you come in maybe two or three days later. I don't think you'd get a week's residue though. Let's say you, you shifted, some issue came up, you had to come in a week later. I don't think you'd get them. Okay. All right. Uh, name of orange worm or mites? Naval orange worm? Okay. Uh, remember what we talked about last year in terms of naval orange worm? This time of year, it cannot get into the, this crop's nuts, all right? There's absolutely no way it can get into this crop's nuts. So what you're pr protecting when you're doing a May spray, or what you're trying to kill, you're trying to kill naval orange worm that goes to mummies that are already on the tree. That is the Achilles heel of naval orange worm. And the only, and, and so in May, if you're not surrounded by pistachio orchards where they actually develop from the nuts that are on the ground and can fly in, I, I really do like that May spray with selective materials. Uh, those would include uh, Intrepid, Proclaim, Belt, pro pro products like that, Altacore, uh, very, very effective on uh, NOW and for a long period of time. Plus, I think you get a little bit, it's pretty full in here, Gina, you got a beautiful orchard. I think you get a little bit better uh, coverage at those mummies. And you almost, if you're doing a ground application, most of the mummies, if you've tried to do sanitation, are going to be up at the top of the tree. So I might start playing, this is where you guys are so good at this, start playing with a calibration on that spray. You know, you might not need it as much low mid as, as you would at hull split. Hull split, you want to cover that opening nut and you're treating it. So at this time of year, if you're trying to get navel orange worm and twig board within your orchard, um, you may want to hit more direct a little bit more to the top of the tree. Now that'll go against any of the calibration stuff that we said as uniform coverage. But here we're trying to maybe target where that pest is going to be, where those eggs are going to be laid. And, and that's what you're doing with the May spray. Uh, honestly, coverage uh, at that top area of the tree is important. But driving slow, that means if you're doing it, um, you can do a pretty good job. I mean, you can torture yourself, try to put a game on. Fortunately, the Giants have been winning. If I think they're playing in the afternoon today. It'd be a great day to listen to the game and spray. But uh, if, if um, you have somebody else doing it for you, you really need to focus on them going under four miles an hour. That's tough for a commercial guy. Their money is, is time. And uh, I prefer two miles an hour. But to get a guy to go four, uh, under four miles an hour is almost impossible. And you just won't, on a tree this size, you just will not get the coverage up top. Well, you won't do it. I'm going to argue, looking at the data, if they're not going to go under two and a half, I don't even think it's worth spraying. I mean, there's no coverage of that 15. Okay, well, I, I, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying two, two and a half. I think you're wasting your money. I, I, <laughs> I couldn't agree. It's so important. Personally, I think that's why we have such an issue in, in walnuts uh, with cotton We We cannot get to the tops of the trees with that. And it's great for resistance because you've always got a, a, select, a group of population that survives and keeps those susceptible genes in there. But uh, I think you're wasting your money if you're, if you're going, uh, I'd say maybe three you don't even think? No, if you look at all the data, both replicated from Franz, Joel Siegel, Dibble, I mean, the UC has I've seen this for 60 something years, and yeah. it comes to the same point. No faster than two miles per hour, and I know that drives people nuts, but if you want to get coverage at above 15 feet, you lose it over two miles per hour. So think about this. Think about what we're talking about. So you've got these variables. Well, all these timing trials we do with the insecticides, particularly May sprays, we're usually done with a handgun. Some of us will do, do them with uh, equipment. So we're getting maybe 300 to 
400 gallons per acre. Nobody does that, but we're getting good coverage. And we're putting it on at the right time, all right, on our timing. Usually it's 100 degree days after you've got 50 to 75% of the eggs on your track. So we're right in that treatment schedule right now. We're earlier than normal. Um, but if you're light on timing, you lose control, maybe 20, 25% control. And then if you're driving too fast, you really are losing money for a spray that may make you sleep better, but not going to do a lot of better in your control. And I know people will say, well, I've done it this way and I'm not getting damaged. My answer to this is you probably didn't need the spray in the first place. Okay, particularly in our groups here with the hard shells. That's the other thing. A lot of you guys have a uh, uh, Padre mix. Those are hard shells. Uh, I don't think there's, for navel orange worm or twig board, there's not an excuse for uh, more than one spray. And I question sometimes one spray on these because it's just very, very difficult for uh, the worm to get in to that shell. Monterey is a different story. You got a late, relatively soft shell, and you're not harvesting Monterey's till the end of October. That's something you've got to be intense on. So look at the characteristic of that nut whether it's a soft shell susceptible to the shell, not the hole, but the shell opening up so that the worm can get in. Uh, if you get a, a, a nut that has a very hard shell, it's pretty tough uh, for worms to get into that. Yes? Is Ariel preferred then? Well, I got a couple of good friends here that Ariel. I, I, um, I, in May, you might, I think it might work for you, but you're not going to get anything underneath. I'd rather go. I'd rather go ground rig for this crop. Don, I'm sorry. <laughs> Where are you? Yeah. Sure. Um, on an orchard, okay. On an orchard like this, I would go 250 gallons. You'll get a lot of, uh, of argument with that, but 250 gallons, a minimum, at, at uh, two and a half. Okay? So that's a lot of downtime. I know guys that have gone, again, I think, say, well, I'm getting good results with uh, 50 gallons. And I'm saying, if you're doing that, leave a block completely unsprayed and then compare the two. That is the key. I mean, we have this preconceived idea that you know, I'm doing it this way and I'm not getting damage. Maybe there's not that damage potential there. And again, I, I refer to the hard shells on that. Um, so, so we were talking about that May spray timing. I, I, I know Kenny well. Uh, are are you, you in the timing now for that or are we still too early for you? I'm, we're right on the cusp of it. Not quite yet. Pretty, pretty close. Yeah, I'm leaning maybe another week. Okay. No, here on this area. Yeah, I'm I'm leaning maybe another week. I think if we go, if you go till the 10th or the 15th, I think you're behind the curve for navel orange one. You still get some control, but I think you're behind the curve. Uh, any discussion on that? Any points? What about heat units and where we're at? Where where where? Okay, on the heat units with more we're, we're right there. We're right at about 350, and our timings, I usually use the twig bore model to base the spray. Remember, that's based on the first moth catch of the season, and then at 400 to 500 degree days through that. So that kind of goes with what we're seeing, that we're a little bit uh, ahead of that timing that would put us, with this kind of weather, it'll put us into it uh, during that first week of, of May. Um, Naval orange worm is pretty much the same, but it's harder to find that fix because it's all based on egg traps, not pheromone traps. It's based on egg traps. And if you're monitoring more orchards, you could probably, in an area, you could probably use all those egg traps as saying, okay, uh, but it's, it's 50 to 75% of the traps that have eggs during one week. So 50, let's say, uh, let's say you have uh, 10 traps in this orchard. Not too many people do that. My math is bad. So if you had 10 traps, five to seven of those 
would have navel orange worm eggs on that. That's when you start your navel orange worm uh, calculation. And we're accumulating maybe t with this kind of weather, 20, 25. So you're looking at four days from that period. Uh, so you're, we're pretty close to that timing um, for May. For, uh, the, the July spray, which I still tend to lean towards, um, I, I look at, um, at oh, about 5% hull split. You can get in there at 5% hull split, the head, light, head height, not from the edge, but into the orchard. And that is based on non-Pirel. That is based on non-Pirel hull split. And I'm talking here on, on, if you're looking at treating other varieties, I use that hull split timing but it's going to be a lot later. Certainly on Monterey's it's going to be a lot later. You're looking there really at treating the, the third flag instead of the second egg laying period for that. Um, did, am I hitting home here? Am I, am I getting across on that? Is there any, are there any questions? And that's where you can use products like McLean, uh, Proclaim. Proclaims look really good in the trials. Uh, it, it's a Emma Mectin benzoate, it's fairly selective. Intrepid's been good. Aldrich, or not Aldrich, but uh, Belt has been very good. Delegate's pretty good. Um, they're all relatively long lasting and they all affect the egg moving to the young larval stage. Hey, they're not contact. Will yes. Delegate flare mice as it kills the rips? I don't know if it flares my, it, okay. okay, it does kill off the beneficials, but it doesn't have that effect of uh, the pyrethroids that actually causes expansion of my populations. Okay. That may be through distribution, but it does kill thrips, um, and if that's a real key, then that's something you may want to, if you're looking at that, if you're putting a mitocyte on, then that's a different ball game. Yes. Is anybody spraying more than 150 gallons per acre? Ever? Kearney Ag Station does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do um, you want to get the most out of your material? That's the question. You can do what you want. You can do what you want. Do you want to get the most? And are you willing to uh, make it hurt? As they well, say. I realize that, but I'm back to that thing. Is anybody spraying more than 150 gallons per acre? There's a bunch of guys. I yeah. I want to know. I'd never heard of that. Really? A lot. 150. I, when I was a kid, we were spraying 400. That was on walnuts. So, you may want to, you, you know, if you're not having an issue, I'd question whether you need to spray. But you're losing a lot if you're not getting to a top of a mature tree and your timing is late. You're losing an awful lot. Okay. Um, my, are we all right with navel orange worm? You want to go twig bore? I'm, I'm, no, I'm cutting into your time, David. Here. <laughs> Twig bore and navel orange worm. Uh, Gina, I think, has probably got some stripes on twig bore here. If we look at that tree, we'll take a look through the arch here. I didn't get a chance to walk through here. But I, I do want to show you when you're, you're looking at my, I, you know, you've heard me say this like, so many times, every one of these meetings. In the spring, young trees like this, you're not going to get much wintering on the tree itself, unless you've got a lot of shaker damage, all right? So most of that wintering is either going to be is going to be on the ground, on younger trees or trees with very uh, smooth bark. Where you have shaker damage or very mature orchards, you'll have both wintering of Pacific mite on the ground and here, usually in the lower scaffolds of the tree. At bloom is when they start moving. Okay, they're only mated females at that time. No males, no eggs. The, they come out, they establish on these lower leaves. This is why so many of the uh, uh, products have been gone. 
on in that early time. You don't have the problem yet, and that's the crux of it. You don't have the problem yet. You're trying to fill that population while, while it's not distributed up to the top of the tree. And then as you get into May, we're about there now. Now it's more uniform. Here's a twig bore strike if you want to look at that. Uh, it's more uniformly distributed within the tree. You can still get good coverage here. But the key to that biology, and particularly now, this is the longest time, the spring is the longest time that those eggs will be exposed without hatching on the leaf. Just because of the weather. It's the longest period of time that you'll have exposed eggs, no mating, it's a real critical time, and so many of our materials, uh, 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 Apollo, uh, Aphromite, uh, Onager, uh, even Abamectin will affect that stage, but those growth regulators are very effective on that young egg stage that is there for a long period of time. They'll go through now, as you get into May and June, they'll start turning those, but now you've got mixed populations. And by the time you get to hull split, a miticide will still work, but you kind of change your, 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 your idea of what will be the product. That's Vendex, product, products like that, Fujimite, uh, uh, Canamite's very, very effective. They're a little more expe uh, expensive than Acromite. But that's the key to that movement of mites, is you get coverage here, and the only crux to that is you don't know if you'll need that mite spray. My experience, most farmers are so fearful of having a mite problem during a harvest that they put that on preventatively. It's a, a I, I, I like to see Personally, particularly on the hard shells, I'd like to see folks leave a few rows off and just see what happens. It's, it's, uh, it's not going to cost you money, believe me. You're not going to affect next year's crop. And as long as you can get into hull split without the foliation, you're in really good shape. So I do encourage looking for mites, and your best place is going to find them is on these interior leaves low in the canopy. If you don't see them here now, I tend to hold off and of course I selectively sample in areas where it's more uh, logical to find them. Stressed areas. Uh, Brian Cook had a, has a, Brian where are you? I, I don't mean to put you on the spot here but he has an orchard and it was really interesting, a really well cared for orchard but he had a hard pan layer and at that point he was actually having standing water on, you don't mind me telling this do you? <laughs> and, uh, and we were out there looking at it, and those trees had the most mites. They weren't getting enough infiltration down to the, to the root zone. He's since gone through and taken that hard pan out. I'm hoping it, it's looking better, but I know that stress, and those, if I'm looking for mites, that's where I'm going to look. In those areas that are stressed, that gives you a head up for the rest of the, uh, of the orchard. Um, we've got excellent miticides. Um, the, the, the two that I, I, they're very, very good, but there's three I don't like to see used as much. Uh, there's the old Fujimite, and particularly early in Desperado, those take out the predators very effectively because they sterilize the predators. They don't directly kill the, the females there. We are at a point that our predators are, our predator mites, and there's a good handout here as low as I've ever seen them and so if you don't have many in the orchard then I guess it doesn't matter what you're using. Um, the other materials, acromite, abamectin, even canamite, envidor, they're not nearly as uh, terrible on the uh, predators but they're very effective on the spider mites themselves. So I'll open it up for question. Gina, thank you for uh, having me back here, all of us here. And Eric, is Eric here? Okay. There they are. All right. Thanks. Go up and thank them for allowing us to be here. And we will walk through the orchard after some time. Yeah. I'll walk through while David's talking. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Okay.